Ja. Ja, ja, ja. Ja, ja, ja. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the post-budget analysis of the Indian American Chamber of Commerce. As everyone knows, our theme for today's discussion is moving towards a futuristic India. We have an esteemed panel of experts to share their valuable insights on the Indian growth story and the expectation from various stakeholders. Well, the interim budget was along the expected lines with no major announcements and a revalidation of the focus on infrastructure Make in India and people welfare. In line with this, the budget speech focused on the four major pillars for growth and inclusive development. First one is the farmers, women, youth, and the poor. Though a more detailed budget is expected in July after the appointment of new government in center. However, till then, this financially prudent yet optimistic interim budget sets a promising path for the country's sustainable growth and paints an optimistic picture of achieving the goal of Vikshit Bharat by 2047. Now, I would like to introduce Arun Karna, Regional President, North India Council at the Indian American Chamber of Commerce, a highly experienced technology lead business leader with more than 34 years of experience in the telecom and IT industry. Arun is, the current, is currently the MD and CEO of of AT&T Global Network Service India Private Limited. He is also a member of the B20 Task Force on Technology, Innovation, Research and Development. Additionally, he is a core member of the CI Delhi State Tech Panel. Arun, request you to please share your thoughts on the interim budget and the overall direction the Indian economy is expected to take over the next 5 to 10 years. Over to you, Arun. Uh, thanks so much, Akhil, for the warm introduction. Uh, good afternoon, esteemed participants and distinguished speakers. My apologies, I'm taking this from a public place, so you might hear some background noise. But uh, on behalf of the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce, it gives me great, great pleasure to welcome all of you to this insightful session on post-budget analysis, moving towards a futuristic India. We are honored to have as a chief guest, Mr. Raman Chopra, IRS, Joint Secretary, Tax Policy and Legislation, CBDT, Department of Revenue, Ministry of Finance, Government of India. Uh, our esteemed moderator, as you heard, is Mr. Akhil Chandna. He is the chairman of our BFSI committee at ICC and IC, and also partner at Grand Count in Bharat LLP. He is joined by such luminaries from the finance and tax domain, such as Mr. Seem Chawla, executive council member, ICC, and partner, AC, legal solicitors and advocates, Mr. Riaz Thingana. Uh, partner Grant Thornton Bharat, Ms. Radhika Rao, Executive Director and Senior Economist at DBS Bank, and Mr. Rahul Agarwal, who's uh, Senior Economist at ICRA. Um, Akhil, as to your question, uh, you know, I would say India has become the, we all know that India has become the fastest growing economy amongst the G20 countries and is currently the fifth largest economy globally. And despite a challenging external environment, the Indian economy has shown a lot of resilience uh, due to strong macroeconomic fundamentals 
and India is expected to play an increasingly important role as a major growth engine globally. The decade leading up to the interim budget, 2024, highlights the aspiration of achieving the goal of a Vixit Bharat by 2047. That is, a Bharat as a developed economy and a global powerhouse. The budget focused on boosting confidence on investments by emphasizing the macroeconomic stability provided over the last 10 years, strengthening agriculture, infrastructure development, boosting employment by means of training, skilling, and reskilling, empowering women, and research and innovation. The FDI inflow during the period 2014 to 2023 at US dollars 596 billion is twice the flow during the preceding 10 year period of 2005 to 2014, marking a golden era. So the government has acknowledged it, it's given a nod to it. Uh, they are intent on promoting sustained foreign investment, continued and successful negotiations on bilateral investment treaties with foreign partners, that will be ensured. And it will be interesting to see how this all pans out. So again, it's a very dynamic geopolitical environment. India is continuing its sustained endeavors towards becoming a US dollar seven trillion economy by 2030 and a developed country by 2047. Now, although it was only an interim budget and you know, the tax regime was largely left untouched, but still the budget covered a wide swath of subjects. So CAPEX has been increased. There was huge talk of rooftop uh, solarization uh, leading to free electricity. Uh, there was a lot of talk of charging infrastructure for electric vehicles, promotion of post harvest activities, expansion of uh, nano DAP application, housing for middle class, expansion of medical colleges, vaccination for girls, a long list that goes on. And there was a lot of focus, I think, on promotion of overall investment, foreign investment. And yes, uh, there is, of course, an income tax remission scheme as well. And, uh, you know, the prime minister said it, that it will empower all four pillars of Vixit Bharat, the Yuva, the Garib, the Mahila, and the Kistan. Now, whether that would really happen remains to be seen. And I think we have got far more uh, expert and experienced people on the panel here who can comment on this. So with that, uh, thank you, Akhil, and uh, I, I hand it back over to you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Kana. I think uh, the fantastic positive outlook you've given, I think you've touched upon everything which was there in the speech, uh, reiterating the confidence and, and you know, taking the economy to 7 trillion economy by 2030, which is which is the vision. And, and I think let's hear from another, uh, you know, esteemed panelists we have today uh, with us. Uh, though you've given a brief introduction or everyone, but I just want to go to Riyas Thingna, uh, who, who's, who has a, more than three decades of experience in tax and regulatory advisory services, be it domestic, international tax matters. He leads professional standards for non audit practice of the firm, uh, Dan Thornton, and also leads the National Tax Office. He's advised many large clients on corporate st structures in the auto, manufacturing, real estate, infrastructure, travel, banking, and re re insurance sectors, whatever you name. So, Riaz, you know, you, you, you've seen the government has stayed within the electoral code of conduct and accordingly not made any significant announcements. From stability in direct and indirect tax rates to ease of compliance, we have certainly come a long way in the last 10 years. Uh, would like to understand your thoughts on the journey covered so far and key tax policy changes required to propel India towards realizing our goals, as, as said by Mr. Karna, before becoming a 7 trillion economy by 2030. I'd like to hear from you, Riyas. Sure. First of all, thank you, Akhil, for that very generous introduction. Uh, I'll start by commenting that you are absolutely right in observing that the finance ministers refrain from making any major or even populous announcements in the interim budget is absolutely in consonance with uh, best practices and democratic values. So I think that's a very big positive. But to answer your question, that over the years, there have been many steps on tax policy, uh, which have gradually and significantly 
supplemented the ease of doing business. The most important one in my view is the resolve to keep away from retrospective amendments. That announcement alone adds a lot of trust in the country as a business destination. Uh, we need to follow that uh, really strongly because I think that is a very, very important uh, measure that uh, has added a lot of trust. Over the years, we've had a lot of uh, changes. You've had firstly starting right from the introduction of GST to faceless assessments, uh, faceless appeals, uh, pre-filled tax forms, and similar other policy changes that, which have overall uh, added to the taxpayer's confidence. But having said that, there is a lot more ground to cover. Changing behaviors at the ground level is a serious obstacle. Uh, we can change policies, but people's behaviors have to change. Of course, this will take time. The journey has to begin. The journey has begun. But this is something that we really need to uh, work on. The second one is the issue of dispute resolution. We have an unending list of pending tax disputes in our courts. Some actions have already been taken by the government to reduce the number of pending cases. Uh, a case in point being the announcement yesterday of waiving tax demands up to 25,000 uh, for cases up to 2009, 2010, and I think 10,000 for the period thereafter up to 2014, 2015. Uh, this is, uh, of course, in addition to various other steps, uh, reducing the number of uh, uh, litigations, tax litigations in the country, uh, but there is a case to be made for introducing alternate dispute mechanisms. This, I think, has been a long-standing uh, demand, and I think uh, this will address at least many interpretational issues and uh, reduce the burden on our courts. Uh, one other issue is that of those various incentive clauses that we've had. Uh, generally, they are for a limited period of time and rightly so. But the trend is that these instant incentives are extended on a year-to-year -year basis. So even in this budget, some of the sunset clauses for startups, for units set up in IFSC, sovereign wealth funds, uh, pension funds have been actually extended by one year up to 31st March 2025. Now, this one year is not enough. There's been a long-standing demand by the taxpayers that such extensions should be for longer periods, say five years, which would lead to more stability and assist businesses uh, in planning their investments. Uh, and this has uh, to be addressed. Uh, while I'm talking about this just uh, on a tangential issue, I also noticed that the lower tax rate for 15% for uh, manufacturing companies has not been extended. Uh, to my mind, it seems to be a slip and we may have a correction because uh, the continued focus that we have on make in India, uh, it, seems, uh, it seems to be a slip. I hope I'm right. Now, uh, you know, you spoke about the seven trillion uh, US dollar uh, mark for our economy. I think there uh, we are well on that path. I think uh, the the rate of growth, the sustained rate of growth, and some of the steps that have been taken uh, in terms of planned expenditure towards infrastructure, agriculture, all the. Uh, social infrastructure, the, the, the key pillars that we uh, need to concentrate on. I don't see a challenge in us uh, reaching the $7 trillion mark unless something drastically uh, wrong happens. You know, but, uh, All these things so far have already provided the platform to uh, take the economy forward on its continued path. I think that 7% and above growth on a year-to-year -year basis uh, seems extremely sustainable at this stage. 
So those are my initial thoughts, Akhil. Over to you. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Riaz. I think uh, very insightful and hopefully uh, our finance minister take note of whatever wish list you've just you know mentioned. Uh, and and I think July we'll see the full budget and those those you know wish list gets fulfilled uh, because it gives a lot of confidence to, to the taxpayers and and can promote you know ease of doing business in India. Uh, before we go to the you know to further, I have one more important you know question to ask. You've, you've seen that government has taken a significant step, you know, to decriminalize minor economic offenses under the Companies Act. Uh, however, this has not been replicated with the income tax laws where prosecution can be initiated even for a minor tedious, you know, offenses. You've seen that. Do you think this can be something for main budget wish list as well, uh, in, in addition to five, six items which you just mentioned? No, no, absolutely. So I think you really hit upon a very, very important thing. You know, to my mind, firstly, tax offenses are mostly, if not financial, uh, I mean, uh, not entirely financial offenses, right? Uh, to take care of any wrongdoing there and non-compliance, defaults, we already have heavy penalty clauses. So in most cases, where is the need for prosecution? You know, uh, let's face it that over the years, we have seen that tax compliance only increases when there is more trust, more stability, more transparency. And this fear of prosecution is so heavy that, uh, you know, small offenses, as you rightly mentioned, on TDS, other offenses, which could be mainly demands being raised only because of certain interpretations and justified interpretations that have been taken by taxpayers. Uh, if they're proved wrong, well, interest, penalty, all that is there. But today we have prosecution notices being issued randomly for some of the smallest defaults. In most cases, there is no case for prosecution and uh, prosecution doesn't uh, get initiated finally. But in the interim period, there's a lot of uh, harassment. This can be an immense problem. So. On the other hand, I see the need that if the, uh, you know, to protect the interests of the revenue, uh, if prosecution pro proceedings need to be there for at least cases where there is a genuine financial fraud, uh, you know, in those cases, uh, at least what can be done is that if prosecution clauses are there, there should be strict safeguards. These safeguards should ensure that officers cannot randomly issue prosecution notices, cannot initiate proceedings unless a whole internal process is taken and a case is made out where there's a prima facie evidence of willful wrongdoing. So I think this is something uh, the, the Income Tax Act, we need to borrow from the Companies Act initiative and we need to look at this prosecution element uh, rather urgently. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ayaz, uh, 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 for, for giving your inputs and sharing your thoughts. I, I like the, the, you know, trust, transparency, stability. I think these are the three, three things uh, uh, which you have been, you know, reiterating again and again. Uh, so thanks to you uh, for your time and for your inputs. Let me now move to another esteemed panelist we have for today, Mr. Hao Lagarwal. Uh, he is a senior economist uh, at ICRA. Uh, so Rahul is a part of the is a part of the economy and state finances team at the ICRA Limited. His focus areas include macroeconomic analysis, forecasting, and policy assessment. So Rahul's experience spans across the corporate, institutional broking, and information service sectors. Thanks, Rahul, for for giving your time and availability for today. Uh, let me come to you. Uh, you know, uh, with a question that how do you see India's growth story panning out in the medium term? Hi, uh, thanks, Akhil. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. So, um, in terms of the medium term outlook, uh, our own estimation is that uh, India's GDP uh, growth potential is at about six and a half percent in terms of uh, uh, real growth. Um, now, this is a little bit of a disappointment to uh, you know people that uh, are expecting a growth of between seven and eight percent, but 
but we have a couple of reasons behind uh, why we expect you know growth to pan at about six and a half percent over the next five to six years. The most important reason is uh, on account of exports. We believe that India's growth is likely to be constrained by a weak demand for exports. So uh, if you look at any you know forecast of global growth, they are closer to about uh, three to three point one percent over the next. Uh, four to five years, which is significantly lower than the kind of growth uh, that has been seen uh, in the 2000s or in the decade uh, uh, between 2010 to 2020. So, so that is something that is likely to weigh in on export growth. And in fact, uh, if we go back to you know uh, the period between 2004 to 2008, which uh, during which India had seen uh, the economy grow by 7.9 to 8 percent. Uh, exports in real terms were growing by about 15 to 20 percent per annum. So that is something that we believe will not be feasible going ahead. So that is something that is likely to constrain India's, uh, uh, you know, uh, real GDP growth. The second thing is, uh, uh, I think, something that pertains to the budget. Uh, so this time around, the government has, you know, cut back on the fiscal deficit to about 5.1 percent of GDP for FY25. And it has reiterated its commitment to, uh, you know, continue on the path of fiscal consolidation. Now, if you look at the capex numbers, they account for almost about 3.4 percent of GDP, which means that, uh, uh, you know, containing the fiscal deficit closer to four and a half percent and thereafter uh, to, uh, you know, uh, lower than four and a half percent would eventually imply either that uh, we need to compress the revenue deficit quite sharply or limit growth in capex. In fact, this is something that is seen in the current budget also, wherein growth is at around 16 to 17 percent versus about between 25 to 30 percent in capex over the last three to four years. Now, uh, in terms of the positive, we are expecting uh, a pickup in the private capex cycle once some uncertainty on accounts of the elections is behind us. But at the same time, we believe that, you know, this pickup is likely to be measured and non-exuberant, unlike in the past, particularly in 2004 to 8, when we had seen uh, uh, quite a bit of exuberance in, you know, project announcements. So uh, all the, uh, you know, necessary conditions for a pickup of uh, the private capex cycle are in place. So, for example, capacity utilization levels uh, are elevated, order books are are looking good, uh, balance sheets are cleaner, um, and uh, the stock of new project announcements is also very high. And in fact, in the last two years, the listed corporate players have made an adequate quantum of profit. So this is something that typically, uh, uh, you know, pushes forward private capex. But uh, but uh, in the absence of, uh, you know, high export growth, uh, of capex announcements and actual execution is likely to be determined by the kind of you know, resilience that we see in domestic consumption. Now, uh, now, what does this mean for, uh, you know, uh, policy rates? Now, uh, uh, basically, we believe that 6.5% uh, uh, potential growth is not consistent with a CPI inflation target of 4%, which the RBI has been focusing on extensively over the last two, three policy meetings. So, uh, we believe that, you know, the inflation, CPI inflation uh, would likely average between 4.5% to 5% depending on uh, where we are in the growth cycle. And uh, uh, this further implies that sub-6% policy rates are not possible on a sustained basis. Uh, uh, given that, you know, uh, we are looking at real interest rates of between 1.5% to 2%. Now, one of the key positives that we also see going forward uh, on account of a weak global growth, so I highlighted that you know export growth is likely to be constrained because of the weak global growth. But the upside is that uh, uh, there possibly we possibly wouldn't see any commodity super cycles in the near term because of uh, you know tepid global growth. So uh, so commodity prices uh, uh, could largely be favorable, and uh, uh, supply shock could be the key determinants of uh, uh, you know commodity prices to that extent. So uh, given that India is such a large importer of commodities, this could be one of the key positives.
Thanks, Raul. I think uh, uh, you you given a very very holistic overview. Uh, and 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 you know, and before we move to the next speaker, just can can we say that you know, government continue on the path of further fiscal cons consolidation while continuing to push growth through the budget in the media term? This is what we are we were trying to say and make an interpretation. Uh, yes. So, uh, um, I, as I highlighted, it will become increasingly more challenging for the government to continue on the path of fiscal consolidation. So, currently, I mean, the fiscal deficit, in fact, the fiscal deficit numbers for FY25 also came as a surprise to us at 5.1%. We were slightly higher than that. But, uh, but pushing CapEx continuously, I mean, growing at double-digit rates uh, uh, would become very difficult if we were to move closer to the 3% mark over the medium term. So fiscal consolidation will have to be a lot slower beyond FY26 in order to continue growth in CapEx. Now, uh, the upside could be that you know if we uh, see uh, uh, ro a robust growth on maybe the revenue side in terms of tax revenues, uh, 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 you know that could change the dynamics there. But broadly speaking, it will become harder and harder for the government to push growth by the way of higher capex if it moves uh, beyond the four and a half percent mark. Because uh, already capex uh, as a percent of GDP is three point four percent, so sustaining that number would be very difficult. Yeah, yeah. So, so quickly, you know, before we move further, any any wish list like Riaz given his wish list and he's expecting it. You know, in July, we can see anything, you know, uh, uh, for the new government, whosoever will get appointed, you know, in the center of uh, any, any, any quick things from your side. See, I, uh, since I'm from a rating agency, I cannot engage in advisory, but I think uh, one of the key things that most economists look at in a greater bit of detail is the fiscal math. So uh, I think as long as the fiscal math is, uh, is, you know, well put together, uh, we are quite happy with the budget. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, uh, we would particularly look forward to is, uh, um, you know, what is the fiscal deficit target and what does it mean for market borrowing? So, in fact, one of the key positives of the budget uh, uh, math currently that we see is that, you know, uh, the government has budgeted for lower uh, gross and net market borrowing. Now, this is very important because it could lead to a lowering of uh, market borrowing costs in the economy. So, in fact, there is another, you know, so basically this implies that the supply of these sex would be lower. And at the same time, we have the bond index inclusion also starting from June, uh, which also means that there could be a higher demand for these sex. So, this demand supply dynamic is looking quite favorable, which could lead to, you know, a dip in these yield. In fact, this is something that we've already seen after the budget announcement. Uh, the yield is almost down by about 10 to 12 basis points. So, that is something that we expect to see continuing, which is favorable for borrowers. Thanks, Raul. Uh, I think uh, in interest of the time, let's move to you know another senior economist we have today, Radhika Rao. Uh, she comes with an experience of 15 years in the field of microeconomics and financial markets research. Uh, she extensively covers the Indian economy and markets alongside selected Asian countries and maintains a key interest in broader Asia and global development to so provide a holistic view to internal and external stakeholders. Thanks, ma'am, for taking the time out. Uh, my first question, I have two, three questions for you, but my first question to you, uh, uh, you know, our, our finance minister mentioned that the digital public infrastructure is one of the major elements for people-centric inclusive development. What are your thoughts on this? Thank you so much, Akhil, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the, for the questions, and I think uh, Rahul has... Uh, put up the macroeconomic backdrop uh, very effectively. Uh, so to answer your question, certainly I think India has assumed uh, quite a prominent role um, in the infrastructure piece. And I think it used to be called the India you know, stack earlier, and now it's been renamed as the India Digital Public Infrastructure. Uh, I think this journey is, is a long one. Uh, and it, I think if you were to take even some of the uh, milestones, uh, Aadhaar is one of the digital identity, uh, you know, um, initiatives that was taken uh, back in even before 2010. Uh, later, you we had more in the in the space of uh, payments uh, under UPI. Uh, obviously, it's now grown to be one of the biggest and the most transactions in the world. 
Uh, and we also I famously remember the finance minister also talking about uh, JAMS, you know, that's J A M JAM, uh, which is the Jandan Yojana, Aadhar, and Mobile number being brought together uh, to strengthen the backdrop of this of this uh, infrastructure or digital infrastructure trinity. Uh, and I think the benefits have been multifold, right? Um, I, I think what what digital infra essentially does is where physical infrastructure is still catching up. It basically bridges that gap in a much, much faster way. Uh, and you have seen that uh, very prominently in the space of subsidies in particular. Uh, you've seen that direct benefit transfers, which began as pilots and thereafter has been made mainstream. It has really helped plug leakages. Uh, by making the whole, uh, you know, value chain or, or whole chain or transaction uh, cashless, uh, and it's also helped India, you know, achieve almost 70, 80 percent of financial inclusions. And if you remember what the finance minister said yesterday, she did speak about DPI being the new factor of production. You know, typically in economics we talk about labor and capital and and whatever is residue is is called the TFP. Uh, but you know, interestingly, she's in, including the DPI as a, as a factor of production in itself, which essentially means that it's going to be the better we get at it, it's going to bring in a lot more efficiency uh, to the growth dynamic as well. And in terms of dollar and cents, I think she did mention about uh, about 29 lakh crores of benefits being passed on to beneficiaries in the last five years uh, due to this medium. And looking forward, um, and how can India, uh, how, how will we be able to make this even bigger? Uh, and I think uh, the emphasis of the budget was very much on making this whole initiative people-centric. You know, end of the day, like I mentioned earlier, Wherever physical physical infrastructure falls short, the final mile fulfillment can be through these digital channels. Uh, what it does is provide citizens services at scale uh, and at low cost. Uh, again, very important when we have uh, you know different tiers of incomes uh, in the population. Uh, the the interoperability of this infrastructure piece also allows a lot of third party solutions to be built on the existing infrastructure, um, and if basically after us, of course, foster a lot more innovation. Uh, and again, another to draw in another example, which is a very event-based uh, solution, was what we did in COVID. Right, we said in the managing uh, COVID COVID nineteen vaccination program was one of those which readily built up on what was already there and helped us reach um, you know the vaccination drive uh, to to millions, uh, literally billions in in most cases. Uh, and another example I can come up with is fast tag. Right, fast tag. You'd seen a cashless toll payment system for vehicles, um, and this has made certainly the highways uh, more uh, more investable and and I think faster growing as well. So it helps to not only take the payment but also the transport uh, data can be captured. Uh, and I think finally on this, I think this this is essentially the whole system being based on open source, right? So basically anybody can inspect, anybody can modify, they can enhance this whole data piece. Uh, and that plays into many of the, the very thriving startup community that we have, uh, which who have, uh, you know, have been coming up with solutions with the real economy problems, right? It's not just a, a solution to a problem that they envisage, but something that they, f they feel and uh, witness around them. Um, and I think so that's where we can be much more people centric. And I think that's where we are right now, taking uh, steps in that direction. Uh, E-commerce portal ONDC, for example, is another one which allows small manufacturers. So SMEs can also get drawn in, uh, smaller players can also get drawn in and you know uh, meet up with the, with the final consumer at a more effective cost and higher efficiency. Uh, apart from just being people centric and being domestic focused, I think the recent G20 also showed us that India could take a global role in this. Uh, we did speak about Global South, um, you know, in the G20, there were about eight countries where we signed MOUs with them uh, to help them build their own, uh, you know, learn from the India's experience and try and attempt something uh, in, in their own countries as well. Uh, so again, I think this the crux of the, the infrastructure initiatives, all of that is very domestic focused, uh, but I think that is where the main attention will be. Um, I think because, uh, you know, you need to serve about 1.3, 1.4 billion worth of people uh, but again, I, I think this is also an opportunity for the country to take a more global uh, view or a global uh, role as well. I think a uh, great example, Radhika. Uh, we, we've seen the recently French president coming to India and, and the highlight for him is to make the payment to a chai wala through UPI. You know, and, and, and he was astonished and surprised the way it's happening in India. We can see today there's no need to carry a wallet or cash. It's, everything is 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 done. Uh, but we have a risk also to to take care uh, with such a huge transaction, and and as, as you rightly said, the kind of initiatives government has taken and and the kind of focus they have, I think this is this will take uh, you know fulfill the dream of 
विकसित भारत बाय ट्वेंटी फोर्टी सेवन यू नो नाउ यू नो लेट्स मूव टू द अदर पार्ट विच इज ऑन द कैपिक साइकिल लाइक फ्रॉम इकोनॉमिक्स परस्पेक्टिव what are your, what are your top three takeaways from the budget uh, additionally what do you think the private sector will participate in the capex cycle you know i just want to hear from you sure um, i think the, um, like rahul you know had captured quite a bit of the math so i think i'll just leave it at three main themes and i think uh, three main aspects where we we saw quite a bit of confidence being expressed uh, by the government right so the first one i think was the the confidence in terms of growth uh, many of the underlying assumptions that have been made is assumed on first the growth will be in the 6 to 7% handle uh, you know tax revenues overall revenues are expected to do well the tax buoyancy for example which basically means that how much is gdp growing by as a proportion of of the of the tax revenues uh, is kept has been kept over one uh, which essentially again means that you know there's structural improvements that have happened in the tax structure uh, stra- uh, tax uh, system which is essentially because of higher due diligence uh, because of digital uh, d- digitalization of records and improved formalization you have actually seen revenues uh, structurally go up as well in the past 2 3 years uh, and of course it has been helped by you know generally corporates also doing better uh, so that that is a inbuilt assumption that is in the math which is that they're confident on the growth prospects uh, and i think that comes also from the money that's been put aside a sizable amount of money that has been put aside for capex um the second confidence is about political stability and political continuity and i think we did see that comment those comments in the uh, in the finance minister's uh, speech as well uh, which essentially means that you know they didn't do any big ticket announcements uh, and i think that was in a way uh, they do know that the economic tailwind is behind them uh you know state elections went well we had seen some changes in the opposition as well just earlier this month uh so they're going in with the assumption and the conviction uh, that they're going to come back uh, after the april april may elections and some of the private sector polls that early private sector polls that are coming out also seem to suggest the same and the confidence on the third thing is about broader macro stability i think the numbers that came out of the budget again uh, in terms of borrowings uh, they did uh, make sure it was uh, you know something that was very easily digestible and additionally it's coming in a year uh, when we're literally saying uh, you know hello to foreign investors in terms of debt investments right reverse indian um, debt or selected bonds are going to be included in the global index uh, ahead of that you already seen about 2 billion dollars of worth money already come in this year and we have just finished january um, so in a year like that they've actually gone on with a smaller borrowing program again bodes well for macro stability uh, i think the one thing that perhaps needs a bit of work is the overall debt levels which is still over 80% of gdp uh, but i think you know strict consolidation uh, going forward uh, will 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 help that and i think we are looking almost at a 1% 1.5% reduction in just a matter of 2 3 years uh, so i think these these three are the bigger uh, i would think takeaways from you know confidence on on growth confidence on political stability and confidence on broader macro stability uh, from not only the fiscal perspective but also current account and and uh, currency and so on um i think the, the second question that you asked was on the private sector and i think that's a million dollar question right we have got the government uh, employing a lot of uh, uh, you know finance money into capex they've been doing that year after year uh, states have also been lent a hand and i think they are also doing their bit um in fact if you just put uh, uh, a few more components what of what we consider as capex is just not 11 trillion it's actually 18 trillion you know there are some other sub components you can add and that overall number goes up uh, now the private sector has been drawn in um, i think if you just talk about this budget i think a couple of avenues where they are they've been drawn in number one uh, i think the borrowings have been kept down that means private sector it leaves a space for private sector uh, players to borrow and the other one is of course the pli schemes that has already been announced there has been some enhancement on that front uh, and i think the third one is this a big um, i think details have yet to be announced but there is this bigger proposal of putting about uh, 1 lakh crores sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. by way of 50 year interest free loans right so yeah, i was coming to that, that. Yeah. Oh, great okay so uh, let me just touch upon that then prem to your question uh, that you know they they would um, you know it, it, again details are not there yet we don't know which kind of sunrise uh, sectors they are looking at uh, you know what what is it what are the contours of this entire um, financing option uh, but if that comes to pass uh, r and d spending is less than 0.5 0.6% of gdp at this point so quite small when we compare global standards uh, but i think this is a step in the right direction that way right for want of financing we don't want any sector to have credit facility issues uh, 
so uh, I think these are some of the things um, to my mind, uh, which which will be positive the private sector, particularly coming out of this budget. Thanks, Radhika. I think before we move further, uh, my last thing, though you've given a lot of perspective to think about, you've given the takeaways, you know, confidence in, in terms of growth, political stability, and, and macro stability. But, you know, if, if we want to hear a wish list from you, both from an Indian and foreign investor perspective, what that could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I'm happy to, why I'm, I'm putting this up, maybe, maybe you know, if a finance minister comes to know, you know, on those fish lists, maybe they fulfill in the main budget, which is coming in July 2024. Certainly, I think um, I'm not a sectoral person, so perhaps I'll keep the thoughts a bit broad. Um, I, I certainly think that the government has done, uh, uh, many pieces have come together, uh, what I like to call push and pull, right? So basically, we have always had an interest in expanding our manufacturing footprint, uh, and this has been often discussed about. Uh, but I think the, the big change that has happened, again, in the past three, four years is what's happening globally. You know, there is a need for a new growth engine. There is a need for an economy to play a much bigger part. Uh, in, in not only in terms of demand, but in terms of manufacturing as a manufacturing base as well. And I think in that way, you know, India is very, very well positioned. Uh, and I think we're making good use of that. Uh, in terms of sector specific things, of course, there are many sunrise uh, you know, sectors. I mean, you can talk about electric vehicles, you can talk about startups, uh, you can talk about green energy. These are some things where there were some piecemeal measures announced at the budget. Uh, but I think further uh, and you had seen again, you know, in, if you talk about some foreign names, Vietnam's Winfast, for example, had expressed uh, an interest in investing. Conversations are going on with Tesla. Uh, we already have um, a very strong domestic ecosystem that's working on the EV space as well. Uh, so these are some of the things that uh, where I think policies over time will be made friendlier. Uh, and you would see not only, for example, two wheelers, EVs, but also four wheeler EVs, the market share uh, go up. So I would think uh, just to, to, to just round up, uh, it's, it's the uh, ecosystem uh, which is being you know developed over time and i think if we keep up that way we certainly can achieve the uh you know uh, three to five to seven trillion economy uh, dream that we have for within this decade fantastic i think thanks that sums up very well and and we are very much on time uh now let me move to the four panelists we have uh, uh i think asim has has got dropped up uh maybe once he's back we'll we'll come to him uh, but bef now we'll we'll go to uh, Mr. Chopra, uh, uh, who's who's an IRS uh, Joint Secretary, Tax Policy and, and Legislation, uh, sent CBDT Department of Revenue, Ministry of Finance, Government of India. Thank you, sir, uh, for taking the time out and 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 you know coming coming to this panel uh, and joining us today. I think I think we've heard from different people. Everyone is very positive. The government has been extremely proactive in seeking stakeholder inputs taking corrective measures to bring clarity on tax and policy forms, uh, as Riaz also said. Uh, uh, and and I, I think we would like to acknowledge the efforts taken by the government towards improving ease of compliances and ease of doing business in India. Though the wish list is never ending, uh, which will which will come uh, whatsoever. And, and and I think for for me, the main thing is the faceless regime for assessments and appeal is a historic move, which has been widely appreciated by the taxpayers we've seen over the time. Uh, 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 with that, I would like to extend a warm welcome again for today's session. Uh, we hope to be enlightened with your insights uh, on, unco on upcoming measures which government intends to take towards further reforms in tax policy and nationalization of compliances. Uh, you've seen, you've heard the economic economists, you've heard Riaz, uh, I think, who's, who's, who's uh, uh, 30, with 30 of his own experience in tax regulatory matters. And, you know, I think it's, this is his 30th budget. He's He's might have uh you know uh, looked into and and and, and as i said wish lists are never ending you've heard the economist uh, radhika rahul uh, there's a lot of expectations around nationalization of tds capital gains tax regime uh, so 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 now we we are happy to you know hear from you uh, what what government is thinking how government is thinking and maybe some clue uh, on what we will expect from the june 2024 july 2024 budget Thank you so much, Akil. Uh, first issue which we start from is that this is an interim budget. Fundamentally, this was an interim budget. So as far as uh, when a request was made to me for participation in the seminar, I, I could not at that point of time share 
even this information that we are not going to do anything because yeah. even that information is a confidential information so i could not share i could not simply tell you that nahi abhi kuch nahi kar rahe aur hum abhi meeting ka koi fayda nahi hai is discussion ka fayda nahi hai but still uh, since it is a budget and we need to carry on the rates the fundamental position in the uh, finance bill of an entire any interim budget is to carry on the rates for the earlier year which have been carried forward that is the basic part of the budget in addition to that uh, there was a lot of talk last year around tcs when the tcs provisions came in on, in the finance act 23 they were through uh, they were discussed a lot there was a lot of critical analysis i would not say criticism there was a critical analysis of the provisions some 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 pain points were pointed out then uh along with that some credit card issues were there da was notifying and denotifying something so all these things actually resulted in a press release of june 23 so since that was a press release it did not form the statute it did, the statute continued to under 26 2061g continued to remain the same as it was amended in the finance act 23 so the press release the view of the government was required to be brought on the statute that has been brought in nothing new has been done in 2061g apart from legislating the press release the portion in the act that has been brought on the act and it has been it will be carried forward even the july to october thing has been incorporated by way of a specific proviso that provisions as on 1st april will continue to operate till 1st october that was also by design that a, a vacant position should not remain between july and october since the new provisions were coming in from 1st of october and the old legislation was coming in 23 legislation was coming in from 1st of july so that has also been taken care of so that is with respect to the earlier provisions second in the interim budget we do not examine per se provision requests in detail the requests in details which keep on coming to us as a part of the budget memorandums from all sectoral associations ministries we do not examine them in detail but in this budget there were some some cut off timelines which were absolutely critical and which were to expire before the july budget so those four cut off deadlines were in fact extended and they were extended for one year there was no detailed thought whether it should go beyond one year or whether it should be two years or whether it should be five years that detailed analysis has not gone into that and therefore they were simply extended for one year we'll look at them again in july and see what needs to be done and what needs to be done for what period of time on the 115 bab manufacturing thing uh, it was not a slip it has been thought over and it has been uh, thought about not extending it as of now that is the position as it stands today so you don't you should not expect a government amendment on that and term it as a slip of any manner but it is a thought about provision and as of now we are doing nothing not extending this timeline in july we'll examine it again and see what needs to be done for manufacturing if anything more has to be done for manufacturing specifically certainly it will come it is not that because what we started from in 2014 other 15 budget i was there as a director at that time also the policy of the government was to make tax regime simpler and the one thing which makes the policy complex is a number of carve outs and deductions which are available on that anybody who seen the income tax act would actually agree on this that there are so many deductions and exemptions which had built up over a period of 50 years but some some sector wants a carve out for it then a carve out from a carve out is made goes on adding provisos and <laughs> sections it makes act complex mr jetley in that budget clearly said that we will not extend the deduction regime chapter 6a if you would have seen hardly any extension has come in any section has come in chapter 6a only 180 la related to ifsc has continued some minor section has also come but broadly we have done away with deductions coupled with this the rate of tax has come down from 30 to 
That is a huge thing. And that was for corporates. Last year, for other than corporates and firms, BAC has reduced the rate for personal income tax. Also. So we are moving away from that regime of deduction and exemptions and going into the regime of no deductions and exemptions. So that basic thing which which was raised by uh, the first speaker Yas was that this should not be a one-year extension or a two-year extension. First part of that answer is in, at this point of time, we are not examining the periodicity or the period for which the extension is made. Second part, in principle, the policy of the department is not to encourage any deduction or exemption, rather go on a direct subsidy basis, direct, direct funding basis, or to provide a lower rate of tax. That is how we see the policy developing at this point. Right? So that, that will continue, that, that will be consistent. Seen along with this is that we are focusing on voluntary compliance. You just see our PIT, PIT collections have increased so much, they're still booming. Just see the personal income tax collections. But that is fundamentally due to the reason that my third party information gathering as SFD has increased a lot in the last year. I'm taking information, each one of us is actually having the entire information which the department has is being shared with you. As a result, that voluntary non-intrusive compliance, that is, that is the focus of the government. Non-intrusive voluntary compliance is the basic cornerstone of government policy at this point of time. And that is the reason that my PIT collections are increasing automatically. For peer, uh, a, a comment also came that at the grassroots, maybe still there needs to be some more sensitization. As the government is liberal on policy at the grassroots also, the policy, the edge, cutting edge should be more liberal, accepted. But you see my 99% of my assessees out of say, eight crores are Except we accept whatever they tell us. So there is no audit, no scrutiny. So for 99.3% 9 of the SSEs, there is actually no grassroots interaction. So fundamentally, yes, there are problems in at grassroots. There may be problems at the cutting edge, but they actually impact a very small segment of taxpayers. Yes, they should, they should also not be. There, there should it should improve and it is improving. The faceless regime was in fact focused on that only. We brought in the faceless regime and we focused on that. In fact, you see the faceless regime also was developed over the period of two, three years. Earlier the video hearing was not there. Then the video hearing was if the SSE asked was made mandatory, both in appeals and as well as assessments. So that was a, a fundamental uh, change which was brought in. So on that angle also, government is, this government for that matter is extremely sensitive on any stakeholder suggestion. I've been in tax policy for more than 10 years now. I have not seen such a sens sensitivity towards stakeholder uh, discussion or dis uh, whatever suggestion comes from stakeholders, we are very, very sensitive on. Thanks, Mr. Chopra. Yeah, so Mr. Chopra, you know, you touch upon a very yeah. good point on the new regime and the old regime. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I, I'm happy that, you know, uh, we, we've come to this uh, this part of discussion as well, because because if I see the statistics, I, if I see the data, 85% of the people uh, filing the personal tax returns still opt for old tax regime. Um, yeah, we, though we have seen a lot of, you know, uh, rationalization of slab rates, a lot of benefits coming in the new tax regimes as well. But do you think that people still want to, you know, follow that pattern of traditional, you know, making the investments to get bad benefits under the tax, you know, deductions and chapter six for that matter and all. And that's why they still want to continue. Maybe the new tax regime is a shift for the new, new generation, but, uh, but 85%, you know, is still people want to opt for the old tax regime. Akhil, the change has come in financial year 23-24. The first, that the major change in the regime, new regime, which is the new, new regime, 115 BAC subsection 1A, 
regime has come and kicked in only in 23-24. The returns will be filed by July 24. And that will be the proof of the pudding. Each one of us, you can, apart from persons who have taken huge housing loans, each one, I have, I myself designed that whole process and tax tax benefit arising on an average investment of two lakhs made by a person in the old regime. Each one is benefiting. So you will see, I am absolutely confident about the returns to be filed in July that we will see a major and massive shift towards the new regime in the returns filed in the next assessment year. That is assessment year 24. 25. I'm sure about it. Yeah. Points taken, sir. Uh, uh, you know, my next question is, as as we've discussed, previously discussed with Riaz, uh, you know, we would, we, we would like to understand your views on the, uh, you know, decriminalization of provision under the income tax laws, where Absolutely. prosecutions can be initiated even for minor tedious offenses. I think Riaz spoke about it. Absolutely. Uh, we want to have your views as well here. On the issue of decriminalization, Yes, the government is focused toward decriminalization. Decri criminal offenses are serious offenses and they should be pursued only in minimal number of cases. That is absolutely taken. There is no running away from that fact. Taken with that, if you see, we are also focusing on our compounding guidelines because compounding makes a prosecutable offense into a financial offense. Fundamentally, if you see, it is a financial, you pay up a compounding piece and the prosecution is concluded. In October 23, we made a massive change in compounding guidelines and presently they are extremely liberal. So, but still the government is absolutely open to any suggestions, specific suggestions on these issues. You point out that these, these compounding guidelines still leave me out, still leave me out. These type of cases should also be there in compounding guidelines, which are presently not there. You just, you, you absolutely, we are open to suggestions because as far as I see, though the act legislation appears to be very rigid on this, but the guidelines in cases where compounding prosecutions are actually initiated, are very are very liberal and restrictive. After the initiation of prosecution, also the compounding guidelines enables any SSE to compound his offense and go back on the prosecution thing. So, as far as the tax law goes, yes, the act stays. There is these are prosecutable offenses. Whether it should be there or it should not be there, that is a matter of discussion. But on an executive side, we've actually limited that window substantially. That is my point. Thank you, sir. I think uh, you get a very good uh, Riaz reacted to your reassuring, you know, on this and other matters as well. Uh, he's given a thumbs up. Uh, I I'll come back to you. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Mr. Seem Chavla has joined us back uh, because I have a few questions to him and then trailing questions uh, to you after hearing from Mr. Chavla. Uh, so, uh, the, Mr. Chavla, uh, thanks. Uh, 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 let me give a quick introduction about Mr. Chavla. Uh, he has two decades of focus experience in advising clients on a variety of domestic and international tax, business, legal matters. He is a member of Bar Council of India and fellow chartered accountant. Uh, 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 as as, as uh, Mr. Chavla, you've seen, you know, speakers have extensively covered the economic landscape and what lies ahead for India in the near future. Uh, against that back backdrop, I would like to drive the conversation towards tax policy and reforms. Uh, my first question too is around the BEPS Pillar 2 project. Uh, considering the pro you know progress of BEPS Pillar 2 project, particularly in you, uh, MNCs have been expecting that the finance minister would provide some directional clarity with respect to changes in Indian tax laws. How do you view this and how is this likely to impact foreign investments in India? Thank you. And I think I can take the liberty of addressing you as Akhil. Yeah, yeah, please, uh, sir. Please, yeah. please. I'm, I'm way, way, way more junior. <laughs> no, not junior, senior. I think we were at a point in time. You yeah. Know, we, yeah. I had the good fortune of you working uh, with us. Uh, of course, we are extremely grateful on behalf of Chamber to have uh, Mr. Chopra with us. Uh, Mr. Chopra's uh, resume 
is, is, is such a treat to watch somebody who's master's in economics uh, as well as a law graduate. And uh, uh, well, we've had this great legacy of the joint sec honorable joint secretary's uh, office, uh, you know, shouldering our uh, yearly, and this is a yearly feature for us to do a post uh, budget and the legacy which he carries of uh, Kamlesh ji, you know, is, is a testament to his being so erudite and uh, being almost a decade, uh, you know, in this particular field. Uh, uh, we all understand that uh, the views which he shares are his personal view and please uh, to the audience, they should not be attributed in any way's views of the revenue, but uh, the sheer fact that uh, despite an interim budget, uh, still he's taken time out. Uh, hopefully this is just a precursor to a sequel when we have a full budget and then maybe Akhil, ourselves and team would have uh, more questions. Uh, having shepherded this, uh, this, uh, this annual feature of IACC for almost a decade and getting the opportunity to present our pre-budget uh, whenever we are sought uh, uh, by the by the North Block, which we do every year, uh, I think we look forward to that opportunity this year also, uh, as and when uh, the chambers are requisitioned for a quick slot in person meeting. But I was very impressed and delighted to uh, see the resume of Mr. Chopra, and and he's been very frank. Now, uh, coming back to your uh, question on pillar two, I think uh, we need to go back a little in time. Uh, to, to make it sound more contextual. We had the BEPS uh, and then we had the MLI 2016 and MLI comes out of uh, the BEPS action plan. And then it graduates to Globy Pillar 1, Pillar 2. So MLI is sort of settling down in terms of those cover tax agreements and where the, the provisions of treaty have to be read along with MLI and the whole question of tax treaty entitlement largely on the principal purpose, Article 27 or 29. So that is still settling down. Uh, I think in about two years time, you will have matters getting escalated where uh, there is a case of uh, a treaty abuse because now the threshold is far more higher. Now, question of pillar two is largely towards uh, the digital and the global minimum tax, which you are talking about, and the fact that we were the first movers in terms of equalization levy. Now at Indo-American Chamber of Commerce, we are very sensitive to the fact uh, that US did at a point in time has issued a flag with regard to our equalization levy. And we had a very candid interaction uh, with the US representative who are part of the consulate and embassy here in terms of what's their stand and we know that there is a pushback uh, in the sense that till the time the world agrees uh, us will not uh, initiate those punitive tariffs because of our equalization levy so i think the developing countries are trading on this a, a little slowly uh, after a very long point in time uh, post the global financial crisis and good things come out of uh, bad as they say good comes out of bad there has been a fair share of uh, tax distribution and the developing countries got onto the table of tax policy making. <laughs> Once the UN is on board and we have a fair through the UN and not that uh, you're only looking at UN, we, the idea is to have a bipolar conversation with regard to global minimum tax and uh, with uh, the countries having agreed and part of G20 also and we had uh, a meeting of uh, finance ministers prior to G20 in one of the Middle East countries. I'm just forgetting the name, was it Qatar or somewhere, where almost all the finance ministers did agree on on, on global minimum tax. I think U.S. tax, uh, U.S. elections have always had a big impact in terms of uh, how their uh, outward international tax policy will look at. And now that we have elections in U.S. and the whole buy-in did not happen for the simple reason that U.S. never got on board on MLI. And therefore, everybody is waiting and watch uh, in terms of they being a large capital exporter in terms of services, etc. So rather than sounding uh, very theoretical on this, I think uh, uh, we need to protect our tax base. And at the same time, it's more incumbent on, on the countries where we have less or... Uh, where the tax rates are lower than 15, and that's why you get a Middle East, uh, a UAE agreeing on a 
taxing a natural person and now you're looking at Saudi also pretty much uh, introducing a tax. I think the buck stops more on those countries which are lower zero tax countries uh, in terms of what happens to the whole issue of uh, top of tax, etc. And as far as we are concerned, I think at a point in time when it settles down, I think equalization levy should go, which is a good thing in, in when I say good thing means not in a very binary thing, because I don't want to see at a personal level uh, as a student of tax law or helping uh, the community at large where you find the whole issue of uh, the vexed issue of what will take a priority, whether it's equalization levy or uh, provisions of uh, the Income Tax Act, because that uh, matter is still in, in a way subjudice, but at the same time, uh, one can argue to say that, well, it's the provisions of tax and then you have to go to equalization levy. So less, less the industry is caught between the two, especially the industries which form part of SaaS, software as a service. Uh, we have a fairly robust provision under the Income Tax Act and the guidance also came uh, very recently with regard to domestic uh, withholding tax obligations. So I think on, on pillar two, uh, since we are chamber and uh, uh, our uh, we are pretty much the bridge between between the taxpayer, the industry, both inward and outward, and uh, the voice to the North Block. I think uh, uh, we need to take a cautious uh, approach. Uh, personally, there is no hurry in terms of being uh, the first one to be off the block in terms of uh, global implementation, uh, so to speak. Uh, the multinational companies need to be they are doing their part of awareness and I'm sure Akhil, uh, at your end, uh, you are one of the leading uh, firms advising companies in terms of being prepared in terms of global implementation, pillar one, pillar two. I mean, sitting on ground here, I, I would feel that, uh, well, uh, they, there shouldn't be a lot of hurry on this. After a long, long time, countries have been able to claim their fair share of taxation. And uh, the, the practices which were... Uh, which were being viewed as aggressive in terms of uh, tax treaty entitlement and benefit and treaty benefits being taken for granted, so to speak. I think those days are are, are numbered. Uh, we have uh, many important questions of law uh, which will which are pending adjudication before uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, on many areas of international taxation. So I think uh, it's better to have a maturity rather than imbibe the policy because it sounds uh, fashionable, uh, so to speak. I hope I've done justice to your question. No, no, I think very well said. And I'll, I'll before I'll come to the next question, I'll go to Mr. Chopra, uh, you know, uh, taking this question forward that uh, as we've seen many countries, rightly said, coming up with legislative measures around this. Uh, sir, is there anything pipeline for the Indian government? And can we expect a legislation or some inputs on this coming from the government? on the BEPS to Pillar 2 project? Uh, thank you, Asim, for the good words. Uh, I loved the stand taken by Asim and his analysis of the whole issue that we need not rush into something. Because especially it is it is a multilateral issue which is going on with reference mm -hmm. to Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. It is not only me formulating a domestic legislation and putting it in place so as to substitute something which is going to happen at a later date. So it is best that we do not rush into something. Yes, it, it will take some time, but it is not that the department is not aware as what has to be done. The point of time at which we share something with the general public will come. And uh, we are working on that. We'll see how it develops, but we are not rushing into something. We are absolutely something then getting back something then having a minimum tax and then going back on it without and keep taking a vehicleization levy not getting our rights and pillar one there's so many they're all interlinked so as of now our position on equalization levy was this that we are not changing as anything either for the plus or for the minus for the time being let us see how the how the process develops both on pillar one and pillar two and we are, when we are closer to maturing on Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, then we'll bring in the rules for 
a consultation with the stakeholders only after detailed consultation on the rules we will bring it on the statute and then proceed further that is my view on it we'll see how it develops foreign tax division is handling these directly our discussions overseas so they will come back to us the tax policy division that this needs to be done and then i will take a decision in the department as what is to be done at what time it is to be shared and how stakeholders inputs have to be taken yes uh the stakeholders need to be ready before they actually are uh, faced with a policy guideline or the legislation we are aware of that and we have been following this even gar was placed on public uh, domain before actually legislating it even after coming on statute it was deferred for a sub sufficiently long period so that people should read it positively and then then absorb it similarly what he said about mli was absolutely relevant mli is now settling in and synthesized te texts have actually been placed where they should be in treaties you see it, it, it if you go through the departmental website open up a treaty it actually incorporates the synthesized text texts which says that this is the agreed view of the competent authorities in most cases so as far as certainty because what we want the government's policy again from the policy perspective is to have certainty in the mind of a foreign investor or a domestic investor or a business businessman that is what the focus of the government is and we will always move towards this and not rush towards it thank you point taken sir uh, very well said uh, thanks for your inputs uh so coming back to uh, mr chavla uh, my last question before we conclude this uh, session for today um as india has emerged as the third large ecosystem for startups globally we've seen that uh, what what further initiatives can the government take for startups do you think what is done so far is uh, is adequate or there's more to be done around that look uh, uh, what mr chopra did allude to the fact that there are shops available for startups which is part of the statute now uh, you have provisions you know dealing with startups and a little bit of angel tax relaxation is also there let's not forget the the interministerial board and the guidelines uh, do assist a startup in getting an accreditation now what uh, is required more is perhaps a fair bit of education which has come from the fintech space to start up there are as i say a cult of lawyers and consultants who are only dedicated to start up you know and have specialized teams in assisting startups what startups do need to recognize is the fact that uh, when these guidelines are here to stay now unless and until you can you feel that you can lobby around the guidelines and get get it more more relaxed or liberal i think if you are a startup and you are looking at uh, employment generation and you qualify those guidelines in terms of intellectual property etc should you make an application yes uh, what can be desired is through ministry of commerce and industry is the fact that if the time period of the application approval or dispensation could be a little more quicker and faster and i can tell you frankly there are a lot of startups who are in the courts now litigating their uh, applications uh, which is not expecting more uh, in terms of legislative uh, dispensation from income tax act that's already there in place uh, i mean uh, of course they'll mange more and uh, you can yeah. uh, uh, you uh, uh, sky is the limit you know when you uh, when you look for exemption and deduction i think it's it's fairly balanced yes the commerce ministry and industry can look up to some more liberalized way of looking at it the imb can look at it in a in a leave more industry very quickly in startup industry no? few things are fashionable few things are not fashionable so uh, we can't have tax policy we can't have policies which are running behind startups you know you can't wag the tail put the cart before the horse you know in a cliche manner if you're a startup you get a registration get a timely registration you know what the tax shops and incentives are you have a new set of guidelines in terms of valuation also now there are few more recognized methods i had the opportunity of addressing uh, the valuation uh, congress the about a few 
about a month ago in Mumbai, and I, I duly acknowledge that the amount of uh, technology which goes into the valuation bit and all that sophistication has been brought into the income tax rules, recognizing those additional methods of valuation, which was a far cry of startups. So, I mean, as I said, the list is endless, you know, and the good part of startups is that they, they keep uh, us on it. You know, uh, whether it's the policy formula situation all around. So that's my two bits on startups. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chavla. I think uh, it's, it's a revalidation of the fact that whatever government has done so far uh, uh, for the startup is 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 uh, is more than enough. And obviously, as you rightly said, your Dil Mangi Mode uh, is a never ending wish list. Uh, but but it's 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 a give and take uh, relationship we have. And and you know, uh, uh, before we conclude to this session, uh, Mr. Chopra, uh, you know, any any concluding remarks from your side and. And any any clues uh, for a, for a, for a common man to see in the full budget, uh, you know, obviously uh, when we invite you, you 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 can't tell us that there's nothing happening in the interim budget. But still, you know, we, we July 2024 is is a bit far. Uh, if we we see the same government coming in, uh, any any key takeaways from your side before we conclude to this session? One thing is clear. Whenever I interact with any association, any sector, I always tell them, just don't keep anything to you. Give us as much as you can so that we can examine everything. So unless it comes to us, it, it stays with you only. I've done this with the departmental officers also. We've been going to field also. We've going, been going to associations also. In North Block also, we meet about 100 associations. Everywhere, we always tell them, just give us whatever you want. Because that is, unless you give us what you want, we cannot we cannot assess it. Asim made one statement that I the views here are my own views. Okay. But the second part of it, whatever I'm hearing from you is I'm hearing on behalf of the government. So whatever you see goes to the government, goes to the policy input. Whatever you speak, whatever you send to us, do send to us before the budget, at least a month before it. Just don't get late. Because anything which has to be which has to come to us needs to be processed, needs to be put up to the uh, finance minister and a whole lot of discussion analysis has to go in that provision. So my request is that when requesting anything, do give us time to actually analyze it and then process it further. So you should keep your deadline for 15th of May if you want to give us anything for the July budget. We'll process it certainly. And a meeting, when, when you come to the North Block to meet, be clear and focused on these are the primary things you require. You can have 100 suggestions. A CII request for 500 pages comes to us, but unless they focus on five or six items which are required to be done, it is not possible for us to actually legislate them. So just keep five critical points that this on behalf of the chamber, these are our five critical points which we absolutely require. Maybe we are able to do two, three out of them. That is a sufficient 60% hit rate, but please come to us. And uh, we are open to discussion, explanation on the rules also 11 UA. It was placed in public domain. I myself yes. discussed yeah. on a personal level also. With so many people, aap mujhe batao kya chahiye kya. So we, that is why we could actually make them uh, which, which is more palatable, which a provision was brought in. At the time it was brought in, a huge hue and cry was there, but it settled properly. And it is, it is a fair provision. So yeah. we are always focusing on fairer provisions with stakeholder consultation. The consultation should come to us. Your prioritization should be clear. That is my my uh, answer. Sir, so, so thank you very much. Uh, in fact, uh, we put together something and I'll request uh, Ms. Sadana, our part of Secretariat, to see that it's presented to your good offices uh, in time. Uh, in sure. fact, uh, yeah. yeah. So, and then uh, basis that, sir, we we put together something. We'll present it to your good offices uh, uh, as soon as we can because it's ready. I mean, I think we can send it uh, sooner than what we say. And uh, 
please have a look at it and uh, and uh, sir we also wanted to take this opportunity and i don't want to steal the thunder from from uh, akil in the sense that uh, post budget sir please do uh, we will seek and reach out to you for a post budget session and hopefully we could do it in person uh, uh, this time and probably uh, seek your time much in, uh, much in advance akil over to you yeah yeah thanks uh, no no sir that that was a request which i was about to make not to mr chopra but to all the panelists to certainly to reconvene because I've I've noted down the entire list of you know wish list and perspective coming from economists, uh, Riaz, Rao, Radhika, yourself, Mr. Chavla, and Mr. Chopra. And I want this panel to reconvene and you know take this discussion further. So thanks uh, for for your insightful discussion and inputs. Looking forward to the full budget in twenty uh, in in July twenty four and and getting this panel again to this take this discussion further. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.